Billy Joel's first solo record, Cold Spring Harbor, was released in 1971. Now, due to a mastering error, it runs slightly fast, making Billy Joel sound a little chipmunky. This version of the album has never made its way onto CD. In 1983, the producer, Artie Rip, went back in the studio, brought some new musicians in, re-recorded some parts, re-recorded some drums, and gave the whole thing a nice new 1983 mix. So if you want to hear the original version of all these songs the way Billy had originally recorded them, you have to do some bin diving at a used record store and, and stumble upon one. If you know this record, that's probably the version you know, the 1983 remix. It's not the original. The original is pretty different. The only way to hear that original version is on 1971 vinyl. And back in the 70s, vinyl quality wasn't very good. Remember Dynaflex? Yeah, not good. So the grooves on this record are like a dirty, rocky road. <laughs> Sounds like they had sand in there. Now, when you play back records, every little piece of grit and grease and fuzz makes a little tick sound. Now I have a vacuum, record vacuum cleaning machine, which I ran all eight of my copies through. You know, you get the, the carbon brush, you put the, the, the cleaner on there, you scrub it, you rinse it off with distilled water or reverse osmosis water, and then you play it back. There's still some grit and grime in there. It's actually in the vinyl itself. About 10 years ago, I took all eight of my original versions of Cold Spring Harbor off the shelf and transferred them into Pro Tools. And I combined, I edited in the best bits from each copy to make one good version of the album. And I set it free on the interwebs, and you guys said some very nice things about it. I appreciate that. Problem is, I didn't pitch correct it on the way in. So it's a little too fast, just as it was never intended to be. The other thing is, I didn't master it. It's flat off my turntable, so it sounds kind of dark, dull, woolly. I've always wanted to do it properly. Now, somebody did take my transfer, pitch corrected it, and floated it on the internet. Problem is, it was also smothered noise reduction, which killed the top end, what little top end there was, and the transients are gone. Doesn't sound great. I always intended to do this the proper way, which brings us to now. I took all eight of those copies off my shelf again, transferred them into Pro Tools again, but this time, I corrected the pitch. Every song is slightly different. You can't just find a playback speed and run off each side. Every song has a slightly different pitch, which I had to find by ear and using a tuner. So it wasn't like I could just find the speed and transfer the whole side over. Every song had to be pitched individually. It was me sitting with a tuner in my ear and going ding, 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 and trying to find the proper pitch by ear with just a little help from electronics. So give me a little leeway on the pitch, but it's, it's, it's close. It's pretty close. The problem with uh, vinyl playback is pitch problems. Sometimes they're off center, which this one was, and sometimes the record is warped, which means on the playback, it's going like this. So not only do you have left and right variants in playback, you have hills and valleys also, which means the pitch goes sharp, flat, sharp, I just hit my mic, sharp, flat, sharp, flat. All right, so you gotta center the records, which means getting the record, taking a steak knife and drilling a new hole, putting it on the record player. My turntable has a center ring weight. It holds the center of the record down, so in case it was warped, you can hold it down. And it also has a periphery ring, which means the ring goes around the outside of the record, holding it flat. It's as flat of a playback as I can possibly get. Plus, I have a USB microscope that I swing over. As the record spins, I can watch and make sure the, the groove stays perfectly in the center. That way my record isn't doing this, where you get pitch fluctuations. It's as close as we can get to a stable playback of this album. I tried to de-click it. I used something called click repair. It's great. Problem is it doesn't run on these new Macs. I had to figure out a way to get into Java and open it. I had to unpack you know, the contents of the folder, figure out a way to open it just in Java. It works great once I got it open. Uh, I also went in and zoomed in on these waveforms and hand de-clicked what de-clicker didn't de-click. That took days, weeks, months. My kids were looking at me like, why are you staring at these squiggly lines? Well, daddy's got work to do. There are some other uh, noise reduction programs I tried, like Isotope, but everything left it just sounding worse. 
I'd rather have the noise in there. It just, uh, it made it, it just sounded like it was shrink wrapped, you know, like it was contained. Here's the top end and there's this noise gate on top of it. No matter what I tried, nothing was satisfying me. So I let it sound like vinyl. Yeah, you can still hear that it's from vinyl. But isn't that funny? Everybody says vinyl sounds great. But the biggest compliment you can give vinyl is, wow, that sounds like it's from tape. You know, it's like fish. Does a, does a fish smell fishy? Yeah, it's fish. The other thing I did this time was I also level corrected and I EQ'd it. I, I did a mastering job to it. So it's bright and shiny and new. Uh, problem is it also brings out some of the ticks, but you know, it's off a record. So here's a few shots of me pushing buttons and turning knobs just to let you know I know what I'm doing with mastering. Now each song on this record sounds slightly different. Some songs sound great. You look so good to me, sounds great. Now, uh, Turnaround, Billy's vocal, really, it's really pinch sounding. There's a lot of two kilohertz in there. There's not a lot of low end in his voice either. I tried to dig out some lows and push down that, that peaky thing around 2K on his voice. I did my best. This is never gonna be an audiophile record, but I think it's, you know, it's pleasant to listen to now. Now to check my EQ work, I took it over to my friend Joe over at Sterling Sound here in Nashville. It's a mastering studio. Ted Jensen owns Sterling Sound. He's mastered every Billy Joel record since 1977's The Stranger album. Uh, there's a really interesting story about the mastering of that record, which is another video. Tune in. Um, but I took it over there just to get Joe and Ted to put their ears on it, see if I was in the ballpark. Let's go on a field trip. Hey, so we're at Sterling Sound uh, Nashville. They used to be up in New York City, but uh, they've moved to Nashville the last couple of years. I want to hear it on another set of speakers, and I want to go visit my friends at Sterling. I haven't seen them in quite a while, you know, pandemic and whatnot. But uh, all right, come on, let's go in. So this is my friend, Joe Nino Hearns. He lurks here at uh, Sterling Sound. He used to be my studio manager. I've known this kid since he was 15. Uh, back on, uh, you know, record collecting music forum. Uh, anyway, so this is Joey. I've known him for a long time. He came to town from Chicago to be my studio manager. We met Ted Jensen. Ted was mastering a record that I uh, mixed and we made contact with Ted and we became buddies. And Joey is now the record troll, the lathe troll. Is that what they call you? <laughs> he's the, yeah. They stuck him in this room and he's he's been cutting records and earning awards and making everything sound just fine and dandy ever since he stepped foot in this building. Beautiful room, isn't it? Anyway, if you ever need a record cut, he is absolutely the best in the world. And I'm not saying that because he's one of my closest friends, but he absolutely is one of the best in the world. He used to sit on the couch while I was mixing and he would read like manuals of lathes and let out a chuckle <laughs> every once in a while. Reading lathe manuals, this is how much into it he is. You can translate that into English later. Uh, but anyway, he's really good. And we're here just to get a little, um, put his put a, a look-see on my mastering work, just to make sure this album sounds as good as it possibly can. Plus, we're at Sterling. Why the hell not? It's a good day to visit Sterling. This is our cameraman for the day, my friend Jeff with the Poltec shirt on. Hey, hey Jeff. So I've, I've hooked up my laptop, which is where I did the mastering. Uh, here are my tracks and I have my EQs and you know compression and all that kind of stuff. I ho have it hooked up through Joe's system and we're gonna take a listen. Uh, I trust Joe so much, I wanna get his feedback on the you know the EQ settings and stuff. Uh, this album took a lot of work, that's why I'm, I'm here. Cut to 20 minutes later. <laughs> we just listened to the whole record as far as you know. Uh, Joey, what do you think of the mastering? I think it sounds great. Are we there? Mm -hmm. It's not too bright? No. Did I, <laughs> did I leave too much vinyl noise in there? No. Okay. I'd rather have a little bit more noise than the artifacts of the denoising. Yeah, I agree. I've tried all the denoisers and they all left so many chirping artifacts that I, I just thought it was taking away more than it was uh, adding. It's like watching an old Buster Keaton movie, expect it to look like old film, because you know what, it, it was film. And this is coming from an old record, like I said, with the vinyl quality, really poor. It's gonna end up in MP3, why make it an MP3 now? Yeah, I did it 2496, <laughs> but I know people are gonna listen to it on MP3, yeah. right? Yeah. Now the vinyl quality in the 70s was notoriously... Yeah, it was different. Yeah, it was, different. It was, I was expecting yeah. the word bad, but different's good. <laughs> Yeah, it was pretty bad. Yeah. These things were mass produced, so it, it, it varied from plant to plant. You know, some some pressing plants were really great and others were not so great. <laughs> and uh, I, I touched on it a little bit in the video, but uh, back then when they had returns, what would they do with the records? Yeah, you grind them up and throw them back in the vat. Label and all, yeah. like I said. So a lot of this, a lot of that surface noise you're hearing is 
this wasn't virgin vinyl like we have now. The vi vinyl we get now is pretty damn good. It's pretty good, yeah, yeah. I mean, the vinyl we had in the 80s with MoFi was really good, but it was, you know, carcinogen. Yeah, um, yeah. People well, and the other thing is that when vinyl's mass produced, you want to make as many records as you can in the shortest amount of time, so you speed up the press cycle time, and uh, it's not ideal. Which means the, the the time that the, you know, you get this puck of, of vinyl, and then the heated plates come down, and how long are they supposed to stay down? Uh, Three depends. seconds? Yep. Oh, no, it's, it's 30, 40 seconds. Oh, like I said, yeah, yeah. I missed a decimal point. It's like a... You know, opening the waffle iron before it's ready, you know. And, yeah, so these are under undercooked. It could be under or overcooked. Or yeah. overcooked. <laughs> right. There's there's one plant who overcooks a lot, don't they? Mm-hmm. Yeah. We won't mention their names, but we know uh, which one it is. Um, yeah. yeah. And then there's... I, I didn't have any non-fill issues on this one, but non-fill means when the, you know, stamper plates go down, the vinyl doesn't melt fast enough and doesn't get time to ooze out to the extremities of the record. Extremities? The yeah, that's out, Outer rim. Yeah. Outer rim? And I'm searching for words to me, but you got my meaning. Yeah, that's what happens when the press opens too soon. It's it, yeah. it doesn't have a chance to to mold. I mean, these are just molds. It's, it's yeah, mold. and and there's there are no quiet spots on any of my eight copies of this. They all have they're all noisy in very different ways. So I did the best I could without taking away from the musical quality of it. Um, like I said before, the the noise reduction was just harming the top end and it sounded like the music was shrink-wrapped and it was just taking the air and the atmosphere and sucking it right out of the music, so I left it as is. So I was here to check on the EQ and and levels because I had to do a ton uh, of EQ work. EQ points that I rarely ever touch, but are we good? Yeah, I think it sounds great. Okay. Had I not known it was, you know, EQ'd like that, I wouldn't know. It cool, does it sound natural? Yeah. Yes. I had had a lot of top end, which there again brings out a lot of the surface noise, but I think without that, it would take away from the listening experience of it. You know, in my car, it sounds great. I don't hear all the snap tack, uh, snap ticks and pops. I almost said snap crackle pop, but that's registered trademark in it. Um, on headphones even, on my headphones, the, the noise floor kind of goes away after I listen to it because I'm, I'm getting into the music. So it didn't, I, I did it to the point where it didn't, it no longer bothered me. Now in here, we have these high resolution speakers. Um, I'm hearing everything, but how many of us have, you know, Jonino Hearns uh, reference system in our house? None. Not even Jonino Hearns has a Jonino Hearns it's reference true. system in his house. I he, come here when I This is his house. He lives here. Uh, his shower's right over there. Uh, anything else? No. Are you good? I'm good. Okay. I, there's another project that he worked on recently. I wish I could tell you about. I, I, I'm proud to say I helped out a little bit with his references, with first pressings and whatnot, so he could reference and make sure his new versions are as good as those old. But that's, I probably already said too much, but when they come out, look for J&H, microscopic little little markings there on the inner, the run up groove of the records, J&H. And, &H. and uh, this is his lathe. This is where he does the magic. And I want to show you this. If you ever see Sterling, the stamper Sterling on the run out groove, this is actually, this is it. This is what did it. This, this has been in existence for a long time. <laughs> since the 60s, this is it. I'm touching it, so anyway. Thank you. Uh, hope you enjoyed our field trip to Sterling Sound and my buddy Joni Hearns. Ted Jensen wasn't here today, but hey, Ted, if you're watching this, hey, whatever. Uh, all right, see you guys soon. Well, that was a fun field trip. Now we're back at my studio, the Ruckus Room, here in lovely downtown Nashville. Let's go inside, and I have uh, some more stuff to explain about this. All right, I'm just going to check my notes from the transfers here. I said... Uh, You'll notice there's an edit combining two mixes on She's Got Away. For some reason, one mix was slightly left heavy, so I adjusted the balance. One and a half dB. And I never noticed this before, but the piano on the song is double tracked. You can hear a slight flam towards the end, but you can also hear a few extra notes on the right hand toward the end of the song. I've been listening so close, I'm hearing things I've never heard before. It's in there. Give it a listen. So on this transfer, like all records, vinyl is a physical playback. And the sound gets worse as you go towards the center. You get about three songs of good fidelity, and then it kind of sounds, it starts sounding like vinyl. There's nothing we can do about this. So the, we call it inner groove distortion. So the distortion does increase as it gets toward the end of each side. Nothing I could do about that. Uh, I think the distortions on the piano are in the original mix because I was hearing them on the outside tracks, not just the inside tracks. Uh, it was caused by playback distortion. That's common in all records. It would go away as the song fades, but it doesn't with this one. Oh, so what that means is the piano is distorted, but as the song fades out, the, um, it sh the distortion should go away. 
It doesn't. So I'm thinking it was the original mix. It might have been maybe the faders, you know, maybe the faders on the uh, console were too loud on the on the piano and it was distorting the two bus or something. Tomorrow is today starts with a blast of white noise in the left channel. And then two seconds to four seconds, the left channel vo volume goes down a few decibels. Okay, so I do remember making that repair. Uh, tomorrow is today. The first two seconds is definitely from a different record, which was, there again, cut at slightly different speed. I had to adjust each song on each one of my eight records individually. So that's like 80,000 songs. I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm not good at math. But uh, as I went along, every song had to be pitched. All right. So that's one edit to listen for. Uh, when I was mastering it, oops, hit the mic again. Now, when I was mastering it, I used the same speakers that Ted Jensen used to do the 98 series remasters and the 2011 series remasters. Not the same speakers, the same speakers. I mean, my wife bought them from Ted. We were at dinner one night, and Ted mentioned that they're going to have to sell a lot of the stuff from the New York studio when they moved down here to Nashville. And she remembered that, and I was up in Sterling um, one year, and I was in his room, and I just kept going on about how amazing his room sounded. It was the most amazing listening experience I've ever had in my life, and I guess I told my wife that story like you know, a dozen or two times. And uh, she called Ted and said, hey, I remember during dinner you mentioned that you're going to have to sell those speakers any chance you can sell them to me. Jamie loves them. Well, Christmas morning comes and I open a box and there's a picture of Ted Jensen's speakers. They're coming. So when they packed up Sterling audio, uh, Sterling um, mastering in New York, two of the speakers went to my house and there they sit. And that's what I mastered it on. That and my uh, other thing I used are my um, Sennheiser HD 650 headphones. I trust these things. I love those things. That with some sonar work software, it's the most perfect listening environment I've ever had in my house, other than these, you know, these speakers. By the way, trivial, but if anybody can connect my t-shirt to Billy Joel, put your comment in the comments. Yeah, leave a comment in the comments. I guess that works, right? Yes, allow myself to introduce myself. Anyway, uh, just some trivial things. So this is the original album. This is one of my eight copies. I made I make notes when I transfer records. I make notes, you know, whether it was off center, um, the impedance on my turntable cartridge, the level I recorded it at. Uh, I kind of do a little Jamie grading on it, and I put a little dollar sign. So you know, after I'm gone, my wife can sell them, and she won't get hosed. That's the original. This, this is the reissue. Now notice, ugh, notice that the picture on the reissue, 83 reissue, is slightly cropped. See his hands? Not my hands, his hands. See his hands? Not on the 83 edition. This version has really nice contrast. This version looks like it's off a of Xerox copy. But also out there are bootlegs. This is a bootleg that I paid $30. $30? $30 for before I knew better. So let's compare that with an original. Let's see, this is my original. Boing! Now look, this one looks like it's really off of a Xerox copy. This is the original. This is a bootleg. Both have the 71 version, but if you think the vinyl on this one sucks, ugh, unplayable. It's, uh, you know, it's interesting to have, but um, when you're looking at these things, if you find one in the bin and it looks like crap, it's a bootleg. There are also a couple of other telltale signs. Um, let's see, this is the vinyl. There are no stars on the, on the label. The original has some stars. It, it, it just looks hand-drawn. It looks, it looks pikey. It looks low, low rent, you know? If you think it's a bootleg, it probably is, because the original version, the original is nice. It looks like a professional product. That, not so much. This one, now, if you can see his hands and it's a nice copy, that's original. If you can't see his hands, that's the 83 remix. Now this ver this has also been on CD. Let's let's see what we have here. I have the original 83 CD with smooth jewel case. If this was a Target CD, it'd really be worth something, huh, guys? This is the original CD mastered by Doug Sex. This is the 98 remaster, credited to Ted Jensen, but it was actually done by my buddy Ted. Uh, sorry, Joe Palmacio. He was working at Sterling. Uh, Ted Jensen's uh, credited for all these. 
Uh, I think my buddy Joe, who sadly died last year, uh, he redid. He was the one who actually mastered Cold Spring Harbor, uh, The Bridge, and Street Life Serenade. He showed me his notes one day. Um, nothing against Ted. Ted's a busy guy. He's one of the most in-demand mastering engineers in the entire world. He and Bob Ludwig are the two, you know, kings of of mastering. Um, Ted, or, sorry, Joe did a really nice job on this. There's also a Japanese DSD uh, reissue with the original cover. See his hands? Nice. Nice touch. Doesn't sound very good. Uh, and then there's the 2011 Ted Jensen remaster. See his hands. Original cover. Sounds good. Ted did this one. Sounds just as good as the 83 CD and the Joe Palmacio uh, 98 CD. A lot of numbers flying by, and I'm not very good at math. I hope I'm getting all these right. If not, you know, comment below or whatever. And then, let's get in the bootlegs. Not only do I have a vinyl bootleg, but, ever seen this? Mm-hmm. Billy Joel, the Harbor Sessions, right here. I think on the spine it actually has the English spelling of Harbor with the U in it. Let's see, Billy Joel, the Harbor Sessions, no U on this one. No U on the front, just the spine. A rare early version of the first solo album includes six-minute version of You Can Make Me Free. Includes in-depth liner notes. Ooh. It sounds like dog bollocks. Uh, it might... Crosley turntables weren't around when this was made, but they found something just as crappy to play this back on, and then they recorded it to cassette. This is not worth owning. I, back in the early 2000s, I wrote a review of this on Amazon. It's kind of comical. Go, go, um, you know, look for it. It's fun. And then there's another version that's even worse. This version, Before the Fame, I think is what it's called. Yes, Billy Joel Before the Fame. Whew. Light a match. This one stinks. He went back and, and listened to some recordings of the time, and um, that's just how Billy sang. The chipmunk effect was just how he sang back then. Ever hear uh, early tapes of Howard Stern from you know the early 80s? He's up here talking like this. Those tapes weren't sped up. Howard comments on this all the time. So even on this version, he's still a little chipmunky. Just know that that's how he sang in the time. Uh, okay, now the other thing I did was I made sure that I kept the spaces between the songs exactly the same as on the original vinyl. I did have to guess, you know, between um, side one and side two, but all the others are down to the sample, making sure that the space between the songs are exactly the same as on the vinyl. Some of them don't have much space at all. Some of them run right into each other. You can hear the, you can see the little tape edit where they just butted the two mixes together. Others have leader between them. Uh, so that is accurate to the original. I tried to keep this as accurate as possible. It's not an idealized version. It is true to its source. It's probably the best version we're gonna get until technology takes over, you know, with virtual reality or whatever the hell the kids are doing now. Now, why am I doing all this? Well, Billy Joel means a great deal to me. In 1983, I saw Teller about it on MTV and I fell in love with the song. So I joined the Columbia Record Tape Club and I got all of Billy Joel's albums, well, cassettes. When they came in, I was obsessed with the drum sounds on Songs in the Attic. I listened to that album over and over and over. I wore the cassette out. This was 1983, remember? And I looked on the liner notes, you know, as, as we used to listen to music, you would read the liner notes, look at the pictures. And I noticed recorded by Brian Ruggles, mixed by Jim Boyer. I know Brian didn't record it, but he was front of house guy. So next time Billy Joel came into town, I went up to Brian Ruggles, his front of house engineer, and said, Mr. Ruggles, will you sign my CD? I'd gotten the CD because the cassette worn out. Uh, and he said, what? Mind you, I'm in sixth grade, and I'm asking, you know, the front of house engineer for Billy Joel to sign my CD. He thought it was a prank. And I go, no, I just, I really like the drum sounds on this. And he, he was so impressed that he took me backstage. I got to meet Billy. I got to meet Liberty. They signed my CD. Brian signed my CD. He took me out front, and he said, read this book, read this magazine, and I was off on my way, and that is why I now own a recording studio. It's all I've ever wanted to do because of Songs in the Attic. I have a Grammy. I have about 15 number one songs that I've you know recorded, produced, and mixed. It's a good career. It's a good life. Thank you, Billy. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Jim Boyer. I hope you enjoy this. 
Uh, I put a lot of love and, and energy into it, and uh, I really appreciate Elio uh, Pace helping to figure out what the correct pitches are for these songs. Now, I want to talk about the pitch correction. Um, I just dropped my glasses. That's all right. Now, I want to talk about the pitch correction. Now, legend and lore will make you think it sounds like a chipmunk record. In reality, it's not that bad. It's slightly fast. Nothing crazy. It doesn't sound like David Seville is going to start singing with Billy at any moment. But it is too fast, and every song is slightly too faster and not as fast as the other one. So they're all it's all a mess. Um, Elio went back and, and listened to... Um, uh, some recordings of the period and figured out what the correct pitches are and he was spot on with it I, I really appreciate that uh, if you get a chance go follow him on all the socials he's he's doing some amazing amazing Billy Joel tribute shows out there uh, so there you go that's the story hope you enjoyed the video hope you like the music even more hopefully I'll get better at these doing these videos anyway thanks for watching